Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to the series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through the One Ring role-playing game, which is by Free League Press. I'm going to be covering the core rulebook, the Ruins of the Lost Realm, and the Tales from the Lone Lands, which are the two kind of expansion books for it. Supplemental material and things like that. I am really, really impressed with this book and this game as a whole. I know that there are, it's been out for a couple of years now, and there are plenty of people who have done reviews on it, and a lot of people who have given breakdowns of how the system works and how combat works and the basic mechanics of the game. So I'll go through that as well, but I wanted to talk about the philosophy behind this game and how it approaches its subject matter, which I think is absolutely spot on and excellent. I have a, well, I should start off by saying I have a very soft place in my heart, a soft spot for the Lord of the Rings and for Lord of the Rings role-playing. When I first started playing role-playing games, I began with Merp, Middle-Earth role-playing. And I played that for a little while with my brother, and then we switched over into 3rd edition D&D when that came out. So I have, Lord of the Rings is where I started. But since then, I haven't played in a Lord of the Rings role-playing game ever. I've never gone back to it. And so I wanted to, I thought, you know, I, I want to give it a try, see what's out there and see, you know, how people are approaching this and, uh, you know, just, just what it's like. And so I looked at the two kind of offerings by Free League, which is the Lord of the Rings role-playing game, which is basically their 5e version of this. And then I looked at the One Ring and I was like, if I just want to adapt 5e stuff to Lord of the Rings, I can do that already. I don't need a whole setting. So I wanted to get the, the new system and try it out. And so I, I, I know it's not new. It's new for me. It's a couple years old at this point, a few years old at this point. But I got it, and I have been very, very impressed. Not just with its construction, not just with its presentation, but again, with the philosophy behind it and how it approaches its subject matter. It is spot on. It really gets the Lord of the Rings, and it translates the Lord of the Rings into role-playing in a very specific way. You can't approach Lord of the Rings in the setting if you want to keep it tonally consistent, the same way you'd approach, say, D&D with the Forgotten Realms or Dark Sun, or right? I mean, there's, there's tonal changes you have to make whenever you approach a certain setting. But the mechanics of this game build the, the, the worldview of Tolkien, which you, know, you kind of have to kind of agree with if you're going to really play the Lord of the Rings faithfully and get that tone right. This system builds right into it. The mechanics of the game work along with this idea, the heroic tragedy that is often the case of the Lord of the Rings, right? The heroic tragedy of its characters. This game builds on that, and not always tragedy, right? Not always tragedy, but often. And I think that the way that this game works, well, I'll go into it more detail, but I think the game lends itself very well to that style of game, that style of story. So first of all, presentation alone. I mean, this map is so incredible. It's just of Eriador. It's just the basically west of the Misty Mountains. So for those of you familiar with the Lord of the Rings maps, but you've got this beautiful detail on this map. I don't know if you can see it. I'm sure you can't. But you can find PDFs or pictures, I'm sure, online and get a sense of what this map looks like up close. Absolutely gorgeous. And that's just the front cover. The back cover gives you a hex map of the same, but it's so vivid. Now, this, this camera does not do justice to how vivid this picture is. The green is so green and the oranges stand out in such a great way. It is an excellent, excellent map. This map alone makes me want to play this game. I'm a sucker for good maps, and the Lord of the Rings is, is sort of the high watermark already for world-building maps. I mean, you know, leaving realism aside, just the presentation of the, the map of Middle-earth is, is iconic. And so it's a kind of a high, high bar. And I would say that is how a lot of this book is. When you're talking about the Lord of the Rings, you know, Tol Tolkien is the grandfather, the father, whatever you want to look at it, of modern fantasy rightly or wrongly, <laughs> um, whether he would approve of it or not, <laughs> right? He is. And every world, either in the way that it is formed or in the way that it is, uh, it approaches the different, or, or in the way that it you know, chooses to go away from the things that Tolkien did, it's almost always a response to Tolkien. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to get away from it. I mean, you, you know, you have obviously sword and sorcery, which links more into the Conan the Barbarian, you know, Robert e. Howard side of things. And that's true. There's also that other influence and element to it. But a lot of high fantasy, a lot of, I would say, mid fantasy or, or really just fantasy in general, owes most of its DNA to Tolkien. And this book understands that and is respectful of it. It doesn't try to, now you're, you're going to be disappointed if you're looking for radical changes 
to the Lord of the Rings. That's not what this is doing, right? This is trying to be faithful to the tone and to the worldview and to everything that, that Tolkien tries to develop in his books. Allowing you to play, I would say, within the world that Tolkien created, rather than sort of spinning it off and making it totally your own and changing things. I mean, you could, obviously, you could take this as a basis, but, but I think the mechanics and everything are faithful to Tolkien in a really, really good way, in a way that I, I really like. And again, that's not going to be for everybody. Not everybody likes Tolkien. I know a lot of people don't like The Lord of the Rings. They don't like um, either the, the, the books or they don't like the, the, the worldview. Uh, they don't agree with him. Uh, I, I do. And I think that it's mostly excellent. Now, the, there are basically two styles of art in this book. There are these pieces, which are digital and kind of um, vague, almost impressionistic. I mean, you can't really tell. The detail isn't really there on faces and things like that. I shouldn't say impressionistic but beautiful, and I think it certainly works. It's not my favorite of the two styles, but it does work really, really well when it's presented. Now, one of the great things about this book is that throughout there are quotes from The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit all throughout. Now, the, the authors had the rights to The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbits, I, Hobbit. I don't think they had the rights to The Silmarillion or some of the appendices and things like that, so you're getting the books that most people are familiar with, The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. Uh, there's some great... Uh, in world writing there from Gandalf but then you get this book and, and this is the presentation throughout you get these beautiful little page elements you get great elven writing at the top with these beautiful motifs throughout uh, and I noticed this on the page of the ancestries or the cultures as they're called in this the races um, the the individual markings match the ancestry you're talking about so you know, the humans or elves dwarves or hobbits basically and you get uh, just a beautiful, beautiful presentation. And then this is the other style of art that you find in this book, which is much more sketchy, much more, uh, I would say, in the style of Tolkien, uh, of, you know, like John Howe or Alan Lee, uh, without the painting, without the, uh, you know, the, the paint style. There's the sketches that you find in, like, the, the illustrated versions of Lord of the Rings that most people are familiar with. It's in, it's closer to that style. And this is the one that I prefer. I prefer this style of, of art. Uh, it gets me right back into it. The player heroes and the lore master. That's what you're talking about in terms of the names here. And, and some advice about getting into the spirit of Middle-earth and how to, understand or how, how to understand playing a game here and how to, you know, changing things. And I, I think it's really, it's really interesting how it approaches all that. What the setting is, it's set after The Hobbit, but before The Lord of the Rings. Um, and that's a long period of time, right, in Tolkien's world. That's a long period of time, so you basically have a, a whole playground of time in between the, the, the events of the movies, or the books, I should say. Most people are probably familiar with the movies, but the books um, and The Lord of the Rings, uh, The High and The Hobbit. Uh, now, when it comes to the, the mechanics of the game, I'll, I'll talk about them in a, in a minute here. But I wanted to, to first talk about this philosophy that I mentioned before and the way that this approaches Tolkien's, um, say, heroes. Now, one of the mechanics in this game is corruption, shadow and your character basically becomes can become corrupt and you pick up a path of corruption when you make your character and then as your character you know has certain events happen to them and as they gain shadow points they become more and more corrupted until eventually they become if it goes all the way they just become evil and then they you lose control of them basically they become a, a villain and that is something that tolkien certainly believes right i mean that the idea that you're going to be playing evil heroes neutral evil, lawful evil, chaotic neutral, selfish people, whatever, that's not th this game. You're not going to be playing D&D adventurers who are out for the money, out for themselves. I mean, you can. You can certainly choose that. But as you play that sort of character, the game basically insists you're going to be getting corruption points as you become obsessed with treasure, as you become, uh, you know, if you become more selfish, if you, if you lean away from being selfless and heroic, you will start to get shadow and corruption and then you will become evil. So the game doesn't say you have to be good, but it says if you choose to be evil, you'll become evil. And that line is clear in this book, good and evil. You're not dealing here with morally gray, <laughs> right? Lord of the Rings, Lord of the Rings is interesting. Tolkien is interesting in his view of good and evil, right? He recognizes that there's good and evil in everyone. Everyone has the chance to fall to the ring sway. Everyone has the ability to be corrupted. Even people like Gandalf or Galadriel, these really great heroes, they can be tempted and fall. So it's not that there's just heroes who are white and, and you know, clear and clean, and then you have the, you know, the dark and the shadow of evil and stuff like that. And it's just like everyone's divided between them. 
No, there's, there's within people, there are possibilities of good and evil, but it's possibilities of good and evil, right? Those terms mean something in Tolkien. And if you choose to be evil, you are evil. And if you choose to be good, if you follow the path, the path of good, if you choose the light, then you are going down the path of the light. So you don't get these, you're not going to get these characters who are morally ambiguous, right? You're not going to get Game of Thrones style characters in this book. <laughs> if you try to play those kinds of characters, you're going to lose control of your, your heroes. Again, as written, you could play it however you wanted. Some people are going to love this. Some people are really not going to like it. I love it. I think it fits with, uh, with often, well, how, I, how, I, how I think of the world. Right. <laughs> that it's not that there are the world is divided into good and bad people, but we all have these, you know, can go either way in every decision that we make. But when we make those decisions, we are actually going a direction. Right? I think that's the that's the difference here. It's not that our choices are meaningless, that we end up back where we started, but that no, we actually go down these paths. So this book really makes that clear. Um so I think that's I think that's interesting. Okay, so the mechanics of the game have, you know, people have explained them in other places, so I'm not going to go into them in too much detail, but you essentially have a target number system. Um, you, the player, know ahead of time what you have to roll in order to succeed or fail, and you are trying to get a certain number of, um, well, you, you're trying to, you're rolling a bunch of D6s plus a D12, and you're trying to get above a certain number. And if you don't, uh, it, there are some other factors there as well, so the D12 has... Uh, a couple extra symbols on it. Basically, the, the, the 11 and the 12 are, one is an Eye of Sauron, one is the symbol of Gandalf, and uh, they do special things if you roll them. Otherwise, they just count as, you know, 1 through 10. And then the D6s, which are the other thing you're rolling, 6s count as special successes. And so most of the time, if you get a 6, you can you get a little pool of, like, super success points that you can then spend to make that success even more uh, successful. <laughs> now, what I noticed is that most of the time, it seems to me, you're, you're going to be succeeding most of the time. But that doesn't mean you're going to succeed every time. And uh, especially when it comes to combat, things can go really bad for you really quickly if you get really unlucky. And it seems to me that that is going to kind of continue as you level up. So leveling up is done in a very particular way. Basically, this game approaches the Lord of the Rings. It, it approaches this game as this is going to be a story first game where the mechanics are there to serve the narrative, you're not going to really get min-maxers, or it's not going to reward them too much, and you're not going to reward loot hounds very much. It's not, it's not going to be a kill all the monsters, get all the treasure, and, uh, you know, that's, that's not the kind of game that you're going to be playing here. You're going to be playing story-focused, narrative-driven adventures where you're going to be trying to mimic, at least in tone and in style, The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, rather than... Um, you know, uh, Conan the Barbarian or something like that. So uh, the the book is just gorgeous. <laughs> I can't really say that enough. Beautiful, incidental art on many of the pages, on all the pages, really, at least on the corners. But on many of the pages, you get these images that are just really, really cool. Um, you get the different uh, ancestries in the game. Bardings, which are, you know, people from the... Uh, the Dale land um, and uh, people from uh, near the Lonely Mountain, humans from The Hobbit, basically. And you get dwarves of Durin's folk who are you know, typical typical dwarves and the abilities they get. You get elves of Linden, hobbits of the Shire, men of Bree, and of course you get rangers of the north. So you can be any of those in the base book. There are a couple of others in some of the supplemental material. Hobbits from Bree are included in here, but also you can get uh, elves from Lothlorien, or sorry, not Lothlorien, sorry, elves from uh, Rivendell in one of the expansions. So that gives you um, a little bit more to choose from. And I'm sure that they will add more as they go forward, Men of Gondor, Men of Rohan, because this book is going to be get these books have already been getting expansions. I think the Moria expansion is coming out, and then they're going, you know, I'm sure we're going to get more and more and more as it goes forward. Hopefully. I mean, I have my fingers crossed because I think it's really good. After you pick your ancestry, you pick your calling. There's captains, champions, messengers, scholars, treasure hunters, and wardens. Now, each of those are, um, like, characters are going to be distinguished by their actions and by, like, their leveling up and choices, but there isn't that much... Uh, moving around in terms of what you're going to be starting with. You can be an elven captain or an elven messenger. Um, 
and you can pick a few different starting stat uh, stat pools. So I'll go back and explain it. So basically, when you pick that, let's pick hobbits for example. When you pick hobbits, you get a cultural blessing, which means it's a sort of an, a, a, just an ability that all hobbits have. Um, then you have a few of them, halflings, uh, you know, standard of living, which is sometimes you get more, sometimes you get less. Everyone has a standard of living. So instead of having to count coins, you basically uh, use a, a level of wealth. How wealthy are you? You can afford stuff at that level. Um, and it's sort of just, you know, for granted that you can buy stuff at that level. Then you generate your attributes and you can either roll or choose one set. And it basically moves around your attributes a little bit. Everybody has the same ultimate value. Uh, everyone's going to add up to 14 points in their strength, heart, or wits stats. And then you're going to have uh, Endurance, Hope, and Parry, which are three basically sub-generated stats based on those first three, Strength, Heart, and Wits. And then you're going to choose Skills, and you get certain numbers of skills. Then you get Combat Proficiencies, which is the weapons that you can easily use. And then you get some distinctive features. Languages, and that's it. So when it comes to starting out a race, you get some abilities, and those are based on each one. And then you get skills, which you can choose and, and swap around. But other than that, you're going to be fairly limited in, in how you differ from other characters to start. You, you're going to get your, your calling, but they get kind of a set thing, uh, except for they get to choose some skills. And then that's it. So you could have a, a whole party of, you know, hobbit uh, captains who would be pretty much the same, except for the fact that they're going to have different abilities and different skills. And that will really change. I mean, that will change your, your ability to succeed or fail on certain kinds of tasks. So I guess in that sense, they'll be differentiated by their skills and abilities rather than by class features and things like that. You're not getting a ton of subclasses and options and things like that. Weapons as well, I guess you're going to find that that's a way of differing your characters one from another. But again, a lot of it's going to come from the narrative and a lot of it is going to come from the sorts of upgrades that you get as you level up. Because in this game... Um, getting magic items, for example, is sort of considered to be part of your progress, or rather, your items become more special as you level up your, your equipment. You, get, you can choose some features, but uh, some extra features and things like that, but as you level up, you're primarily going to be getting um, more equipment and more specialized equipment, and it's going to be then particular to you. And this is what I meant by it's, it's, it's really hard to min-max this game. Uh, Items are kind of given by the, the lore master for specific characters. So when, you, when you're, you're given advice in the book that when you generate magic items, say, you should have a particular character in mind and that magic item should have a particular narrative purpose. And so when the player gets that, it's theirs. And it becomes theirs and it stays theirs. You can't really trade and mix around your magic items. There might be some circumstances where you would allow them to, but like the Horn of Boromir, the Horn of Gondor, is Boromir's horn, Right? And when, when you make a new character and you, like, you, know, you, you kind of pass the lineage down, because the game assumes you're going to be kind of doing like a series of adventures with one character and then they're going to have a, a successor, then in those circumstances you can kind of pass magic items down, like the way that Bilbo gives you know, the ring and sting and uh, the mithril shirt to, to, Bil to Frodo. It's going to be assuming you can do something like that. But for the most part, you are going to have what you start with and you're going to then progress those things and they're going to get better and you might find a magic item that replaces something that you have and then you're going to use that but you're not going to be swapping around magic items like oh i found this magic ring so now i'm going to give it to this player because it, it's you know it's, it suits his uh, particular build better than mine and it's like no that's not how this game's working in fact the upgrades that you get so say you get a, a keener axe right or something like that like a, an axe that cuts a little deeper that's yours you can't trade it if you, for whatever reason, were to give that axe away, it would lose that feature. So it's not that the axe is keener, it's that you have a keener axe, <laughs> if that makes any sense. And again, some people are gonna love that, some people are really not gonna like that. Um, I think it's awesome because it fits with the narrative focus of the game, but you know, some people just will, will, will find that frustrating. Some players will find that very frustrating. Uh, so as I said, basically when you generate your character, you have your space stats, and then you have a bunch of secondary stats that are developed off of that, or three secondary stats that are developed off of that. And that, once you've generated your base stat, you will then know what your target number is for all of your different skills. And it's because each skill is divided into one of the main attributes. So there are, for example, 
uh, there are skill categories here. There are heart, wit, and strength stats, or skills, I should say, excuse me. Heart, wit, and strength, and there are six for each of them. Now, what's interesting here is that there is a skill, there are skill groups that there's one skill for each group. So let me give you an example. If uh, you have um, personality skills, well, persuade and hearten and awe are all in the personality group. But awe is strength, uh, and hearten is heart, and persuade is wits. So, you know, you can think of those as all different ways of uh, developing your character's personality. They're more awe-inspiring if they are really inspiring to those around them, or if they, if they intimidate people, if they're kind of uh, terrible, <laughs> awful, in the classic sense of the word, or they're inspiring people around them, or they're very persuasive. Those are all three relevant to their personality, but they come from different base attributes. So it's just a way of thinking about them and breaking them down a bit into the different skill groups. And then there are rules for when you might use one or the other and the consequences of using one or the other. So basically, once you've generated your target numbers, uh, you'll know what you have to roll, which means there's sort of a set difficulty as the game goes on. Um, you, as a lore master, don't have to do a lot of DC generation, which is a huge portion of DMing, right? How difficult would this be? How difficult would that be? You can give advantage or disadvantage, essentially, is what it's called. It's basically giving them an extra die or subtracting one or two from what they're rolling. So you can do that, say this is harder or easier. But, but for the most part, you're not setting that. The target numbers are set. They know what they have to roll, which again, some people really like, some people don't like that at all. Uh, you get distinctive features for your weapons and for your uh, for your characters, um, and they are they're really cool. Faithful, um, fair, proud, secretive, stern, very much in the flavor of the Lord of the Rings. Tall, <laughs> being tall, is an attribute. It's a it's a distinctive feature in this game. You tower above most of your folk. That's interesting. <laughs> I think that's really, really interesting. Now, endurance and hope are two different ways of, they're basically two different pools that you have. Endurance is sort of your hit points. It's how hardy you are. And what's interesting is as you take damage, as your endurance goes down, uh, your carrying capacity also goes down. And so that means you're going to be discarding your equipment, basically, as you get more, more and more tired, which means you'll kind of, that's one of your, your, your risks, is that as you go down, you're going to start to have more and more trouble carrying stuff. Uh, including equipment like armor and weapons. So you might have to, you know, toss all that aside, and then you're in real trouble if you're trying to get out of somewhere dangerous. You become, you become weary. And that also has mechanical effects as well. If you're, if you're weary, you start to ignore um, certain roles. You start, you start to become disadvantaged on things, and you start to approach uh, everything from a, uh, from a negative place. So you really don't want to become weary in your endurance as your endurance goes down. Rather than just dying out right at zero hit points, which rarely happens, um, you become weary and more and more weary, basically. And, and it's going to be more and more likely that you're going to fail on that key defense check, um, parry check or something like that, when you're attacked, and it's going to be a much more distinctive strike, and you might die that way. You're going to get wounded and then die. Then the other element here is this idea of hope. And hope is a pool that you can use to... to give yourself advantages on things and to succeed. But if, as your hope goes down, you can become miserable. And miserable is really, really bad. You don't want to become miserable. Uh, very dangerous to become miserable because then you start to have um, real problems. <laughs> when you roll, for example, certain things on the on the uh, special die, the d12, bad things happen. Or if you just roll the one, one, two, and three um, on, your, uh, on your success rolls, on your regular rolls, then you, you start to fail. So uh, it's either that or the other way around. It's either the fatigue or the um, hope. I think it's hope when you become miserable that that starts to happen. So you, you become just generally bad at everything. And again, you don't want to be miserable, which is, again, a really cool feature from a way of building into the flavor of the books. Because in the books, yes, people can get wounded. People can get injured. But it's rarely that they get hit point damage, right? It's not like they're getting hit in battle and therefore they're damaged or something like that. Like, that doesn't happen very much. They might receive a wound, which is then narratively significant, right? Uh, Frodo getting stabbed on Weathertop or something like that. But it's it's rarely that they are taking hit point damage and then going back up and hit point damage. That's, that, that's not how it works. So in this game, basically your endurance is is what's going down. It's how weary you are. And then once that goes down, then you're in the position to be kind of knocked out with a quick strike. 
Um, you can get really unlucky and be knocked out with a quick strike right away if you got really unlucky. But mostly it's your endurance is going to be going down. And therefore you're going to become you know, weaker and weaker as the, as the campaign goes on, the adventure goes on. And then the other side of that is hope, right? I mean, in The Lord of the Rings, hope is one of the key features. It's one of the key ideas, is hoping in the midst of, of, of darkness and shadow and, and almost, you know, the, the, the fine line between hope and despair and trying to stay on the one side of it. That's a key theme of Tolkien. And so bringing that in as a mechanic makes total sense. That you want hope to stay strong, that you can draw on your hope, but if you hope again and hope again, you keep on drawing on it, and you don't succeed ultimately, you don't come to the end of your quest, that hope can turn into misery, and then you can you can fail. And that 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 actually the miserable condition is what's making you fail. The fact that you've lost your hope is what's making you fail. That's cool. And again, mechanically, it works in with the tone of the world and the game. So that's what I mean by this being totally consistent in its tone and mechanics. I love that. Uh, as a game, people might not enjoy that. But as a product, <laughs> as, a, as a work, a, a, a design, and, and, and keeping all things together and consistent, it, it is really, really cool. Um, virtues, some of the things that you can get, cultural virtues, so these are ways of distinguishing your characters. When you basically level up your hope, <laughs> you get um, virtues. Uh, level up the hope is that's the wrong way of putting it. But when you when you you can choose basically as you get as you're leveling up, you're going to be getting up you're going to be going up in different dimensions. You can either choose physical rewards like better weapons, better armor, or you can choose character traits, virtues that make your character slightly distinct and they give you advantages on things or resistances to things or they let you do special things in the moment. And they're divided up by culture, so you're, by your race, um, as D and D used to call it. And they're all really cool. One of the things I, I thought was brilliant about this game is that after reading through it, I wanted to play one of each. I wanted to play all of them. They're all presented really well. Even like Bree folk, you're like men from Bree. They're kind of silly in the hot, or in the Lord of the Rings. They're just kind of like there. They're presented really well here. To the kind of thing where I want to play them. Also, I want to play the Dunedain. Also, I want to play the dwarves. Also, I want to play hobbits and rangers, and, or uh, I should say uh, elves. The combat is really interesting. Combat is done in, as a series of basically stances. So instead of being like mechanically positioned around the battlefield, you use you can use a battle map, but it's really just to show who to show who's engaged with who. Distance isn't really a thing you're worried about so much. Um, there is basically you can be uh, aggressive, neutral, or defensive, and then you can be ranged, and you can only be ranged in, under certain condition, conditions. And depending on which position you're in, you get optional secondary abilities to use in combat, and you have a, a base. Uh, advantage or disadvantage to attack and defense. So you can choose, I want to be more aggressive, I want to be more defensive and protect my fellows, and it's really cool. It's a really cool way of doing combat. Making combat, so one of the things that's made clear in this book is that combat isn't going to be happening all the time, right? You might have a couple combats per session, maybe. Maybe a couple of combats per adventure. The combats are meant to be much more narrative heavy, much more significant, and therefore much more dangerous. So combat is not something like the indie where you're just doing fight after fight after fight or like old school games where, oh, random encounter, now we run into it and have to figure out how to solve it. No, fights are much more narratively significant. And, and that, again, fits with the tone of the game and how that fits with the Lord of the Rings. Here are weapons, how much damage they do. That's the damage to your endurance. What the injury uh, um, DC is when you, when you uh, take damage with it. Uh, how much load, so what it, what it, how heavy it is, and then what combat proficiency you need in order to use it in the first place. And then some notes on special abilities for each of them. Uh, and, and then there's armor, which you have leather, uh, leather shirt, leather corslet, mail shirt, or coat of mail. And you get a helm as well, a buckler shield or a great shield. The, there aren't that many weapons, there isn't that much armor, but then uh, once you level up your stuff, it's going to get more specific, and so it'll kind of be more distinct than just... Uh, a great sword or a, a great axe or something like that. It'll be it'll be more special, but you don't you don't necessarily just get to start off with your special cool stuff. You start off pretty basic, and as you play a campaign, as you play through a journey, you're gonna then start to get better and better stuff.
So after the combat stuff, you have the council section. And the council section is, you know, it, it mimics in The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit the fact that, you know, very often the heroes, the main characters, Bilbo, Frodo, the, the fellowship, they go before these very important people and have these very important discussions, right, that sometimes last for many, many, many pages. So you have the Council of Elrond, right, Who uh, who's going to take the ring to Mordor? You have in The Hobbit, you know, is, is the elven king going to let the dwarves go or is he going to imprison them? You have these very important moments in the books where council and, and interactions are more than simply like, hey, roll a check to see if you persuade them, right? Uh, this has more of a procedure, but it's, it's a guideline procedure. Um, and so it's pretty, it's pretty uh, loose and allows you to change it as you see fit, but it has a, a given structure to how you do it. So you set the resistance. So if there's some reason why the company isn't particularly favorable here, then it's going to make it a little harder. Or maybe it's going to be easier because the company is is made up of characters from the same culture or something like that. Then you have the introduction, setting the stage, and that's an important moment, right? How you set the stage. Um, the how are the council? How how is the players? I should say. Excuse me. How is the company going to set the stage for what they want? Uh, you know, what, what roles are they going to use? Um, you know, they might use awe to impress the strangers quickly, right? That's one idea. So you try to show, uh, I, I am this very important lordly figure and the people that I'm interacting with are now intimidated by me and that's going to make the interaction that I have with them of a different nature. Um, now, then you have the actual interaction itself and that's going to be back and forth, a lot of role playing. And the book says, you know, how are we to uh, role play that? How are we to... What should we put the emphasis on? The book, book basically asks you, what, what are you to put your, uh, your emphasis on? The, the roles or the role playing? And it kind of gives you some guidelines for, for how to do that in this uh, sidebar here. Then it has a breakdown of useful skills for each of these sections and what you might use them for. But again, it's going to be up to the players to kind of figure out how to use their skills and, and how to role play it so that they get the, the end result that they want. And there are then mechanics for how well they've done. And if they get really bad on all of their roles or they, they do really badly in certain ways, then they'll have a disaster. And then that's, you know, that would be the, for example, in The Hobbit, when the dwarves are thrown into prison by the elf king. That's a disaster, right? Not only do they not get what they want or there isn't a success with a drawback, but there is just outright failure. And now a new obstacle has been presented. How are we going to escape from here? So that would be an example of that. Uh, but then after the council section, you have the journey section. And this is really interesting. It's mechanically really cool. It's broken down. And one of, the, one of the pieces of advice here is that you should try to, as a party, as a table, get away from discussing things in mechanical terms as quickly as possible. Not to say you don't use the mechanics. I, I've, I've seen a couple of videos on this and I think people made the mistake of thinking that like these are rules that are presented but you're not supposed to use them, which was one, one reviewer that I saw on this said that. That's not, that's not what they're saying. Uh, they're saying, no, you should try to get away from discussing the, these rules in mechanical terms as quickly as possible so that you can just narrate the journey and do the process without having to talk about it as a game. Because again, it's, it, the, the, the movement should be towards narrative throughout the whole thing. And I really, really like this. I, I think the, the mechanics here are really cool. They're not the sort of thing that I would do for a D&D-like game, um, but they are the sort of thing that I would do for this sort of narrative-focused game. Because as you're proceeding through this journey, the longer it is, the harder it is, the more um, setbacks you, you receive, the, har the harder it's going to be when you get to your destination. So basically you don't do this if it's an easy journey down a road. You don't do this if it's just like a day travel somewhere. You do this for a journey that's going to take you know, several days. And the, at the end of that journey, your destination is going to be a narratively significant place, right? Now this is gonna be a, a dungeon site or an adventuring site or a journey site or something like that. If you do that, then this journey will have real significant effects. But if it's not going to have it, if it's if your destina destination is a place where you're going to rest for a long time, where time isn't of the essence, then there's no reason to do this whole process because by the time you get there, well, you can just rest up and all the effects, the negative effects that you'll have accrued over the course of the journey will disappear. So that's one thing is that, you know, again, for a game like D&D, we're doing, say, hex crawls or just kind of exploring random hexes. This, this system... in. Uh, explicitly says the players are, are not going to be going out into the journey into the wilderness without a destination in mind they have to pick a destination in mind when they set out and you're going to journey to that destination uh, there are uh, different things that can happen to you uh, as a result of your journey and there are roles that are assigned there's you know scout and uh, 
well, let's see what the rolls are. Um, they're given back here. Um, yeah, so you have scouts, you have um, hunters, uh, you have guides, uh, you know, basically uh, lookouts, that's the four, yeah. Scouts, hunters, lookouts, and guides. And all four roles have to be filled. Uh, and so if you have four party members, they each can take one. But if you have three, two or three party members, then they have to double up. Or, and if you have more than four, then a couple of them can have multiple people doing them. So you can have kind of a little bit of extra help on a few of these. But there can only be one guide, for example. You can't have multiple guides. And then each of them are going to have different kinds of checks that they make, and, and they're going to have different successes and failures, and different bad things can happen to the party as a result of their failures. But it's not really going to be great. I mean, the, the best result is that you get to your destination without having lost very much. But journeys are hard, and they are not going to be easy to deal with. It's kind of the idea here. Then there's the fellowship phase, which is kind of in between. It's downtime. And fellowship in this game is really cool. Really, really cool. There's a lot of different things you can do over the course of that downtime, um, including ever, once every few downtimes, you have this event called Yule, which is essentially like really extended downtime. Uh, and that's where you can heal scars, for example. That's where you can appoint an heir uh, or raise an heir, I should say. Uh, you can recount a story so you can write you know, the uh, the events that you have previously uh, done, in a, you can write them down or sing them or write a song about them or something like that. Again, very much in the flavor of Lord of the Rings. Then you get the lore master section of the book, which is how to run the game along with, you know, just advice, but also mechanics. And there's lots and lots of creatures in here, tools for the lore master to use, when to give advantages and disadvantage. Um, and... Uh, just a lot of the you know, other mechanics, that injuries and the sources of injuries that you could deal out and dole out. How to play lore master characters or NPCs, and then this shadow mechanic, which is basically um, corrupting people, right? Or as people get corrupted, as the players become, their characters become corrupted, uh, they they develop this. Um, they basically choose a way to go wrong, <laughs> and I think that's really cool. Um, and they develop flaws, and then eventually, again, I think they can completely lose control of their characters. One of the things that's mentioned here that I find really interesting is this idea of intention when it comes to gaining shadow for your misdeeds, right? The idea is that attempting to do something bad, even if you don't succeed, gains you shadow, gains the character shadow, which is good, right? I mean, the intention is what's important here rather than the actual effects of your action. That fits with, again, the, the, the Tolkien worldview here. It doesn't matter what your intention is. You're trying to do something noble, you think, but the action that you're taking is is wicked. I mean, take it Boromir, right? His 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 desire is to save his people, but he attempts to take the ring from Frodo by force. That's that's a misdeed, even though his intention is good. So I like that, and I also like the idea that even you can accidentally do something that gains you shadow, but only if after the fact you realize that it was worthy, uh, that it was an evil deed, for example. Right. If you, if you, if your character is repentant and tries to atone for it or something like that, then maybe the shadow is lessened or maybe they don't gain any at all. But it's this idea that it weighs heavily upon you, that your actions, when you realize what you've done, weigh heavily upon you. That's the idea here. And that is really cool. It, it builds in an idea that, or rather it draws in the idea that there is sort of this objective. You ought to do these things and you ought not to do those things. And Tolkien was, you know, very clean, clear about that in The Lord of the Rings. And so that's what this book is, that's what the, this mechanic is trying to get at. So it doesn't matter whether you wanted to do something evil, or you were trying to do something evil, if the action itself is one that it, is a misdeed in this context, then it is, it, it will gain you shadow, it will weigh on you. And as a result of that shadow weighing on you, right, other things will happen to you. Uh, madness or vengeance, sickness, right? <laughs> the lure of power, the lure of secrets. And there's those different paths of, of madness that you could take and then consequences and tra traits that you get as a result of them. The adversaries that you're going to face. Uh, quite a few really cool ones, but there's uh, not that many because you're not going to be facing tons and tons of different monsters. There aren't, you know, one of the things that I often criticize settings like uh, Forgotten Realms for is that they're kitchen sink settings, right? Everything is in that setting. I mean, mind flayers, and beholders, and vampires, and mummies, and, you know, uh, gosh, eldritch abominations and, and undead are the two that I'm listing there. But you also have orcs, and you also have giant spiders, and you also have, just name a thing, it's in the Forgotten Realms, right? That's not true in Tolkien's Middle-earth. There are certain kinds of enemies. There are humans, evil humans. There are orcs. There are trolls. 
right? <laughs> There's a few things. There are undead, wraiths, and uh, things like that. There are wolves. And then that's it. Now, dragons aren't even mentioned in here. Now, there is a section at the end for bringing in kind of creatures like the Watcher in the Water. It's in one of the appendix, you know, things from the other, the ancient realm. And uh, I think that's really cool. But really, that's not the focus, is, is going to be fighting these crazy big things. Combat, while I think really interesting, is not going to happen all the time, and so you're not necessarily going to need a huge variety of creatures to make that interesting. You, you stick within the, the Tolkien world when it comes to the creatures that you fight. And you can have plenty of interesting encounters with evil people, right? Human beings. Let alone orcs um, and, and the other things you can add in there. Again, some people aren't going to like that so much. Some GMs are going to want more variety in the things that they throw at them. You don't want to use the whole D&D monster manual. Uh, it's not really going to fit with this, but you could you could add in stuff if you wanted, right? The mechanics for the enemies aren't that. It's not that complex. So you could build your own creatures fairly easily. Uh, one of the uh, mechanics in this game that is really cool, I like it's the eye of, this idea of the Eye of Sauron, the Eye of Mordor. So as you start to, as the party starts to become more and more important, and as they start to do more and more important things, Mordor is going to pay more and more attention to them and will try to oppose them. I think that's really cool. You know, so that would be something that a high-level party would have to deal with, whereas, you know, just a bunch of hobbits doing sort of some local things that I have Mordor is not going to care. Uh, then you have a section on the world. And as I said before, this just focuses on the region of Eriador, which is west of the Misty Mountains. And so you're going through the, you know, the Shire and Hobbiton. Uh, more of that is detailed in the, uh, the box set. You get much more, I think, details. You get maps, for example, of Hobbiton and the Shire. Um, but... In, in this book, you get just a basic amount of information about it and uh, different encounters that you might have on the road in each of these different regions. In the Greenway, um, you have the Barrow Downs, which I love the Barrow Downs. Fog on the Barrow Downs is one of my favorite chapters in Lord of the Rings. The South Downs, the Weather Hills, the Etten Moors, uh, Mount Graham, uh, the Trollshaws, Tharbad, and Tharbad is sort of the focus of uh, one of the other expansions. Tharbad and its surrounding regions, their adventures built there. I like Tharbad a lot. It's a great city um, to to build an adventure around and to, to build a uh, a campaign around. I think so. They they chose well in their in their uh, place. Now you have adventuring in Middle Earth with a great piece of art here. Adventuring in Middle Earth: the when, the where, and the what. Important questions to answer. Of course, the why and the who as well on the next page with an appendix um, and a couple of appendices. So for patrons, that's one of the things that the game is going to assume. You kind of have patrons. And most of the patrons are, are characters from the books. You have Balin, you have Bilbo. Um, let's see, who else do you have here? You have Sirden or Kiridan, the ship, right? You have uh, Gandalf the Grey, um, Gilran, uh, the mother of Aragorn. And then uh, you have Tom Bombadil and Goldberry. Uh, the Rivendell expansion adds in uh, Elrond as a patron as well. And then you get the Star of the Mist, which is a short adventure, which is good. They include uh, some pre-made pre -made adventures there, or a pre-made adventure. And then you have Nameless Things, which is the generation of the old creatures, like the Watcher in the Water, with really cool rumors about them, uh, where they are remembered, and uh, where they're encountered, when they're, or when they're first encountered. Um, the thing can be described as, you're very vague about its description, you're not going to describe it in detail. It's going to be more uh, this imaginative, evocative, horrifying, hopefully, description of this thing. With uh, an index at the back, character sheet, and a journey sheet that can be either you know, used themselves, or I would imagine even on a scan or something like that. So this book is... Really, really incredible. Oh, and of course, it has a uh, bookmark. This book is really incredible. Again, I think in terms of its construction, it's great. The, the sort of a glossy matte uh, finish. Not quite, but it's it's basically that. It's great. I like it a lot. You kind of hear that. It is really well constructed. The, the design of each page is beautiful. The design of the book is, is beautiful. It works together. Now, one thing I will say is I, I read through this book... I've been reading through this book really slowly because I like it. I enjoy reading it, but it is it is kind of a it's kind of a, a hard read. 
I mean, there are lots of rules. The basic mechanic is simple, that you're, you roll a bunch of D6s plus a D12, and you're trying to get over a target number, which is determined by your base ability. That's not hard. But then there are so many other rules that kind of are added in and added in and added in and added in, and so many different words that you need to keep track of. Hope, virtue, uh, skill, ability, uh, parry, injury, like when, when it comes to the, 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 the weapons, you need to know the damage they do, the parry uh, rating that they have, or your parry rating, you need to know the, I guess that's the parry rating of your armor, um, or your shield. <laughs> See, I'm going to get getting confused. I'd have to go back and review those sections. I'm not ready to run this, in other words. And I've been reading this book for quite a while, I'm not ready to run it yet. So this is not an easy book to just pick up and say, all right, I'm going to learn a new system and I'm going to play it. There's a reason there are lots and lots of different how to play this part of the game videos already out there. Because it's it's going to take some time. I think it's worth it because I love the tone and I definitely want to run this, but it's going to take me some time to get into it. So that's one caveat, is that the book is beautiful in its construction. The writing is interesting. I love that they have quotations from Lord of the Rings that fit with, with lots of the different subsections. Whenever they introduce this ability, they have a quote from Lord of the Rings next to it. Or whenever they introduce this section of the book, they have a quote from Lord of the Rings that, or from The Hobbit that fit. So I liked all that. Um, the maps are beautiful. The artwork is excellent. The design of the game seems really good, and it fits with the worldview of Tolkien. It blends it pretty seamlessly from a mechanic setting, uh, from a mechanical point of view. The mechanics lend themselves to telling the kind of stories that The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit tell. So excellent all there. But that comes with a cost, and that cost is time in terms of figuring out how to run the game. So keep that in mind. If you're looking for a quick, easy, you know, OSR kind of game, this is not it. But if that's not what you're looking for, and I, and I would, you know, that's not what this kind of game is going for, then pick this thing up. Now I'm going to quickly go through, and I mean quickly, go through these two books, The Ruins of the Lost Realm and Tales from the Lone Lands. I'll start with this one. Tales from the Lone Lands, uh, it also, also, you know, again, beautiful, similar construction. It's got that um, matte finish. I love that you can see uh, ruins up here and down here in the background as they're walking through this misty lake. The bird flying, really cool. Once again, you get that excellent map. Um, and uh, back cover has, again, the same thing with the locations from this particular adventure marked. So you know, or from this particular book, I should say, marked uh, on here. So there are different uh, adventures and where they are. You can't really see them too well, but they're marked with white on this one. So it gives you a bit more in terms of where you're, uh, where you're going, because this is a book of adventures. So you have um, six all said and done. And similar construction, beautiful book, the introduction and the overview, uh, and how to approach the different adventures. A troll hole, if there ever was one. So a great adventure with NPCs presented and motivations, how to introduce the characters to it. Now, one thing you'll see is that these are definitely... Um, how would I put it? These are definitely narrative adventures rather than hex crawls, open-ended dungeon crawls, that sort of thing. It's not to say there's a, a linear path you have to follow, although at times it, it sometimes feels that way, but there are particular chains that lead you down certain paths and how to go from one part to the next part. So, you know, keep that in mind. Some of them are less like that than others, but some of them are like that. That's going to be the kind of game you're playing. It's much more narrative heavy. Not that the players have no choice about how to approach it. Obviously they do. They're not railroaded, exactly. But it leans in that direction. Uh, these, these books lean in that direction. Great piece of art there. Really cool. But you could obviously modify things to make it a bit more open-ended. These are the sort of as-written adventures, and they're really well-written adventures, especially I think this one, I like this one a lot, Messing About in Boats, which is a quote. Um, but I think it's about a quote. Maybe it's from The Wind in the Willows. <laughs> uh, actually, I think it's from The Wind in the Willows. And then how to, you know, when you go home. Kings of Little Kingdoms. This is about a fake Gandalf. Or a, a wizard, a guy pretending to be a wizard and the trouble that he's causing in the region. 
This one has a ruined tower dungeon, which you can be going into with a creepy uh, thing down below. And then not to strike without need. And that's a great piece of art. This is Tharbad, and you see this uh, sort of general look of Tharbad in, in the Ruins of the Lost Realm, which is much more just about Tharbad um, and the surrounding region. It's much more of a gazetteer with a couple of adventures and, and quest hooks and things like that. But this one is just an adventure book, Tales from the Lost Land. Really cool. And again, some of these are... are some of these lend them or like lean into the idea that they're kind of early initially connected to the Lord of the Rings, but very vaguely. Um, you get a few references to characters from Lord of the Rings. You get a few ideas that, you know, things are being set up for the Lord of the Rings, but they're not really clearly pushing that direction. This is much more, you know, these adventures could happen or not happen, and the books would still stay the same, essentially. <laughs> the quest mount gun to bad uh, so so yeah that's you know again you might want to connect it more to the books if your party if your players expect that more have more characters Gandalf for example or Balin or something like that but if you don't you don't have to do it you can leave that out and uh, just uh, again you get magic items and you get uh, adventures and particular bad things happening <laughs> this one is particularly interesting there's this cleft into the ground that basically is the source of darkness and like, a, or one of the places where the dark can just come right into our world, come right into Middle Earth, I should say, not our world, our world. But uh, yeah, here's a worm white, uh, a worm, a, sort of a dragon-like creature. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and you have to destroy it somehow. You have to seal this cleft. And depending on what kind of like an elf can look into it and will see something different than what a hobbit will. It's kind of cool because the elves can see a bit more. Great book, Tales from the Lone Lands. Just an adventure book here. Six adventures, great art, um, cool magic items, cool monsters. Uh, a little bit linear, uh, railroady in their presentation, but not bad at all. Now this is a great one. One thing I found interesting is that this, this is really long. Maybe that's just mine and it wasn't cut right, <laughs> but it's a really long little, um, what do they call that here? Now this one starts off with Tharbad and it also comes with a map of Tharbad which you can give to your players, which I think is really cool. Let me open it up here. Here's a player map of Tharbad. Look at that. Again, the color here is just... Well, again, you can, it doesn't do it justice in this camera, but it's it's very vivid. That green is vivid green. And the, uh, the city itself is really cool. It's got a key down here. And I really like Tharbad. I mean, just the, the idea you have this big old broken bridge that crosses the river with, you know, three distinct portions of the city. There's some ruins on the outskirts that aren't uh, necessarily settled very much. One of the things that this feels like, the Lord of the Rings in, in this part of the world feels like, is it's post-apocalyptic. And I think that's by design. Um, I think that's part of the, the idea, is that, of course, you know, the realm of Arnor has fallen. And so this is sort of the, the aftermath. The Shire is a bit of an oasis in a, in a region. The Shire may be Bree, in a region that has really fallen apart and is divided into these little small holdings that kind of don't really know much about what's going on in the wider world. So it's in that sense, it's, it's apocalyptic. You know, this is not Gondor. This is not Rohan. This is not united under in a United Kingdom. This is uh, farmsteads and homesteads and walled little outposts. Um, but you have, so an overview of the book, Fog over Eriador which is sort of a general introduction to the city of Tharbad and what's going on there. Great piece of art there, I love that. You, you get a sense of what Tharbad is and what it's like. Here's one part of the city, here's the middle, and then the other part here, what's going on there. The rules for the captain's guard, um, yeah, the rules for the, uh, the city, so you have to follow. With NPC art and descriptions of them and what they want, so you get a breakdown of this location and the environs around it. Swanfleet, which is another place nearby. And what's happening there and the characters that are there. There's a little uh, uh, Londeer, which is a little location here, with a little settlement near a ruined, ruined town. Uh, some creepy chain skeletons there. Um, the Dwarf Halls. That's a great piece of art there, this tree growing out of the tower. 
love that. So one of the things, again, that this book does is just beautiful art here. A Gathering Storm, which is a bit of a campaign, um, and and the, uh, the Black Numenorians and the Southern fleets are going to try to invade and cause trouble and uh, present a problem. So there's a conspiracy to invade Tharbad and to destroy the region and uh, cause trouble and to spread Sauron and his power. And there's some really interesting villains here and NPCs. I like it a lot. I think this is really cool. The campaign is much more open, it seems to me, because you get a bunch of just characters and NPCs and events happening. Other shadows. Uh, and then you get a section of landmarks in the back, and this breaks down uh, major uh, locations on the map. The old dwarf mines, there's a great map of those up in the hills with descriptions of the rooms and the passages. Uh, the white towers, really cool piece of art there, and uh, how they're broken down and what might be there. Uh, the Tree of Sorrow, which is a great location with the little dungeon beneath it. Oh, this one's great too. The Shrouded Isles, or Islets. And what's going on here? So basically this book is, yeah, I gaze it here with locations, adventuring locations, and uh, things to run into. The Queen's Hall. Oh yeah, Londir. Gandalf the Grey shows up sometimes there. So that'd be a good place to meet him if you need to go. Perhaps Gandalf the Grey is down at Londir speaking to the Queen there. There's Weathertop. Really cool description of it. And why you might visit it. A really cool dungeon here where you go, you can see the tower growing through the thorny wood and then you go down into this thing and go up into the tower itself again. I think it's really cool. And then the tower has it map here. So you can go up, up into the tower. It's a really cool dungeon and really cool design there. Mount Graham, an evil location, obviously. Cool carved face with a dungeon behind it. And then lost in Mount Graham. What might happen there? And then uh, there's a giant spider. Horrifying to me. Great maps. Great pieces of art, an appendix there for special things you can find. And the same thing here, so you have a, a, a map of the whole place with marked in white where you can find the different locations. The key shows which locations those are. Really great book. I like this one a lot better than Tales from the Lone Lands because it's more of, again, a gazetteer, it's more of a region, gives you information. You get this and you know a lot more about Tharbad and a lot of different locations to run into and to run. This is much more of a campaign or an adventure book. So you're, these are set adventures. You can, you can run them out of the book. This one will be do, uh, it'll take more work for you. You have, to, you have to do more on your own to develop it in the first place. And of course, it also comes with this beautiful map. So I, I really can't speak highly enough about these books. They're beautiful. They are uh, crafted really, really well. They blend Tolkien's tone into a role-playing game in a very, very, I would say, cohesive way. And if you like Tolkien's works, if you like the tone of his books, if you like his worldview, uh, his, his, his beliefs and his, his writing and, and the, the, the literature result of his writing, which is kind of, again, that heroic tragedy, then I think you'll really like these books. Um, Aside from the Shire, Lord of the Rings is not very lighthearted, right? It's it's not very lighthearted. So these books do a great job of keeping that tone. The Lord of the Ring, uh, the, the Hobbits are lighthearted. And that's not to say there isn't joy, but it really is joy. It's not frivolity or happiness. You're not going to find kind of casually, you know, laughy things here. Aside from the Hobbit. The Hobbits are, are pretty silly, especially in their um, supplement, which I have, but I, I'm not going to go through it here. Anyway, I highly recommend The One Ring, especially if you are interested in that, again, that tone, that vibe. But just as artifacts, if you like Tolkien's world, they're worth having. <laughs> so I'm going to definitely run these, but uh, I'm glad I own them, even if I were never to run them, just because I like them uh, quite a bit. So hope this has been interesting, and I'll see you guys in another video.